14 year old boy who presented with fall while playing and in this setting what happened was that this child had a fracture of the distal radius and at that point of time he did not have any family history there was no predisposing factor then somebody thought that there is a fracture we need to do a dexa and a dexa was done which showed a bmd of minus 2.2 and everybody was concerned whether we need to give this person a treatment or not now if you really look in terms of when should we be evaluating for somebody with this regards definitely if you look at these criteria which we will discuss subsequently just having single fracture that too of the radius is not a indication of evaluation and we know there are so many factors which can influence the dexa at this point in time so because he just had one fracture we should not have done dexa here and this would have caused more confusion than any other situation and again he is prepubertal bone age is delayed so this dexa value is of no importance in this setting now we have another situation of a four week old girl with oi diagnosed recently started on zolindronic acid at a dose of 0.025 which is a standard dose which has been used for quite some time now this child developed fever which is a common thing which improves with paracetamol but what happened subsequently was that she also developed seizures because of hypocalcemia and this is important to understand because hypocalcemia is very common particularly if there is a calcium vitamin e deficiency and if we use a higher dose so we need to be careful in terms of starting off with regards to a lower dose in this perspective to achieve a proper outcome in this situation so what we'll do over the next 20 minutes or so is to go through in terms of various aspects of low bone mass evaluation assessment and management now the key question is when should you really suspect about low bone mass definitely bone pain is not an indication don't go for bone pain do not evaluate for that perspective only evaluate if there is a significant fracture and what really is a significant fracture in children we need to understand that this basically is that 50 percent boys and 40 percent girls will have a fracture in the first 18 years of life so this is common but if somebody has got a spinal compression fracture or if they have two or more uh, long bone fractures before 10 years of age or three or more below 18 years of age that becomes significant so this for me would be the most important thing to look at before you order a dexa because we talk about so much pitfalls which are there if you do not do it properly you will have a lot of problems if there is an underlying condition of course and if somebody is on treatment like steroids you may have to do a dexa in that situation now the next issue is what really causes low bone mass and because we're talking about therapeutics as well a basic understanding of pathophysiology is essential so when we talk about bone mineralization in this regard, the bone strength depends upon number of other factors than just the bone mineral. It also depends upon the size. So if you have a shorter bone, a smaller bone, it will be weaker. It depends upon the diameter. So a broader bone will be bigger. If you have a thicker bone, it will be better. And of course, if you've got more collagen, more mineral, you will be better in that perspective. So when we talk about bone strength, it is a combination of number of factors including the micro architecture but what we assess is just the bone mineral density so that cannot be used as a surrogate marker so to speak in this perspective to achieve a successful interpretation in that regard now if we talk about now about pathophysiology we all know that there are three cells which are central for the bone development we have got the osteoblasts which are producing bone osteoclasts which are destroying bone and we have got osteocytes which are regulating each other and this physiology is important for not only knowing the diagnosis but also in terms of treatment so osteoclasts have got everything to produce the bone they produce the collagen matrix they produce the alkaline phosphatase and Dr. Raja told us that how this alkaline phosphatase is pivotal to ensure bone mineralization Along with that, we have got the osteocalcin and all the component of bone being produced by this osteoblast. The osteoclast, on the other hand, does an appropriate destruction of the bone in a very targeted area using the enzymes, the acid phosphatase and protease, it causes dissolution. Now, this whole process is regulated by a number of genetic pathways. So, we've got the WNT and the beta catenin pathway controlling the osteoblast. We have got sclerostin, which is actually coming from the osteocyte to control, basically inhibit the osteoblast. We have got 
rank ligand which goes on and then acts on the level of the osteoclast to ensure that there is a bone resorption and simultaneously we have got a destructive OPG which is going to block this rank ligand causing decreased activity of the osteoclast. So the osteocyte, osteoblast and osteoclast are all interlinked and they have got a very good mechanism to control that. Now, there are other factors which will control it. So, the more physical activity you do, the more muscle strength will be good in terms of body strength. If there is more adiposity, it will be bad for the body. So, these are important factors to understand along with a number of hormones. And most important hormone is estrogen, which is an anti-resorptive hormone, which is important for both boys as well as girls. Now, this estrogen in boys will come via the aromatization, via the testosterone, which can also has a direct effect in terms of bone growth. We have got growth hormone, which is anabolic for bone, which acts via the IGF-1 or directly. We have got calcitriol, which of course provides calcium and also has got a role in terms of improving the bone health. We have got cortisol, which inhibits a number of pathways, is bad for the bone, which also increases osteoclast activity and decreases osteoblast. And we have got thyroid and parathyroid, which cause overall bone resorption. So in this perspective, there is a complex web of things which control bone mass. And from that, we can easily now know what causes low bone mass. So low bone mass could be a problem of bone formation because of a problem of the collagen. And this is classically OI. And this will be one of the most important things we'll discuss in terms of evaluation and management. It could be because of an alkaline phosphatase problem as Dr. Raja talked about hypophosphatasia. It could be because of a problem of the osteoblast itself because of the WNC pathway, which is a rare form. There could be a problem of increased resorption, which is largely because of a testosterone or a estrogen deficiency in this perspective. Or it could be because of a number of other endocrine disorders, which include the cortisol abnormality like Cushing syndrome, thyroid and PPH abnormality causing hyperthyroidism and hyperparathyroidism abnormalities in calcitriol action and growth hormone. So we are mainly going to focus on OI as to how things have changed in terms of treatment here and for the glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis and of course how do we assess in terms of bone health and the number of factors. So the next issue of course is what are we looking at when we talk about bone strength. So I talked about bone strength in terms of multiple factors. So how can we assess that? We can look at an X-ray but that is a very crude way of assessing because only when 30% of bones will go, will we be able to pick it up on the X-ray. If we talk about qualitative ultrasound, not useful in children, bone biopsy not possible. So the most important tool that we pediatricians have, and I'll discuss a bit more about that, is a dual energy enhanced X-ray absorbimetry, along with PQCT, which is now available in certain centers in the country. Micro MRI is the thing which will help us develop later. But most important, of course, is the DEXA scan, which basically is working through providing two different uh, beams which are zoomed through a particular body and then based upon differential absorption divides the body into the lean, the bone and the muscle component. Now, which side to choose is very important. We can use total body, but it will include head, which has nothing to do with a body strength of bone. So that is out. The next option is total body less head. So everybody, right from infancy, in the initial two years, you can use a bone mineral content, which is the total body. After two years, you can use a Z score of the BMD. Then you can use a lumbar spine after the age of five years. You can use femur. So avoid using femur till 18 years of age. So if you are talking about pediatric, you're looking either at a total body, less head evaluation for bone mineral density or bone mineral content, or in terms of the lumbar spine assessment, which is there after the age of five years, no role of femoral assessment in this regard. If somebody is less weight bearing in that perspective, you can use a proximal femur. And finally, you can use a forearm really. But mainly we're talking about the spine or the total body in this regard. Now, PMD comes up with a number of limitations, including depending upon the size. So if somebody is short, you will tend to underestimate their bone strength. If somebody is delayed puberty, you will underestimate their bone strength. Again, if the software is the adult software, that will cause a lot of confusion. In that regards, if you are not using the appropriate reference range, 
in that perspective, this can cause confusion. A problem of obesity may also cause an issue or if there are artifacts which are there in this regard. So we have to be very careful in terms of interpreting the DMD in terms of appropriate features in this regard. So for that, we've got different corrections which are available. We can use the Molgard equation which corrects for height for age, bone area for height and BNC for bone area to give us an appropriate bone strength perspective. We can use the bone mineral apparent density which basically has got specific equation to convert this bone density into an apparent density. But this is not the ideal way because we are looking at volumetric density and this aerial density will never be the best with regards to the a proper mechanism in that regards. The other way to look at is to look at how the muscle and bone interact with each other and within this model we have got components like BMC for lean mass which will tell you whether the lean mass is compromised and whether the bone is compromised or not. So if we look at the lean mass in dynamic test and if the muscle mass is normal and bone is low it is a primary problem while if the muscle mass is also low it is a secondary problem. So don't just go by a single Text a report, look at all those parameters before you really assess in terms of the appropriate diagnosis. Now, if you use uh, adult software, and this is a common problem which happens, you will have a problem that you will be looking at lesser area as bone because the adult software has a higher threshold as compared to pediatric software for the bone. This will result in providing you a falsely high bone density. So do not use uh, adult software. And this is an example, 16 year old girl with recurrent fractures, she had three fractures, had normal growth and development. Her BND, however, was reported as just low, not very low. In that case, she was advised treatment. When we re-evaluated from a pediatric software, we found that the death score actually was worse off. So if you use adult software, you will have a falsely reassuring result in this regard. Now, how do you interpret? If the z-score is above minus 2, nothing to worry. If the z-score is below minus 2, we do not label it as a osteoporosis or low bone mass in children. We refer it just as a low bone mass. If there is a z-score below minus 2 with fractures, it is then labeled as osteoporosis. And finally, if somebody already has a spinal compression fracture, there's no need to wait. You can label it as osteoporosis in that regard. Now, PQCT is a tool which is basically based upon micro CT. It provides information about bone quality, particularly volumetric density. You tend to use the radius, which provides you information for both trabecular bone as well as the cortical bone. So it gives you a differential equation. It gives you results in terms of cortical thickness and volumetric density. So it's a good way to really look at how strong the bone is. The problem is not available in most center. It provides information about how much strain that particular bone can take without causing fracture. So these two tools are very important in terms of evaluation. So now once we have got that this child has got a low bone mass, the next issue is how do you manage that condition? And for that, we will first talk about when to treat. So only those people who have got a documented fracture or an underlying condition like a CR, like a, a Osteoporosis is imperfect, that has been conventionally treated, but newer guidelines are suggesting more liberal treatment in this regards. So this is the expert panel recommendation, which basically talks about the fall in BMD Z score in puberty. So if somebody has got a risk factor for low bone mass and the fall in BMD is going down, you may have to treat. If there is a no risk factor, then your cutoff becomes minus three. So we are not only talking about absolute figure we are also talking about fall in BMD which is becoming important in that regards so how do we treat what options do we have in terms of treatment the options in this regards depend upon physiology so we have got the osteoblast which forms the bone you've got osteoclast which resolve the bone and they are controlled by the osteocyte so osteocyte produces rank ligand stimulating the osteoclast which causes bone resorption. It produces sclerostin to inhibit bone formation by acting upon the osteoblast. And then osteoblast controls basically the osteoclast using OPG. So what can we do in terms of improving outcome? We can think of anabolic agents like growth hormone and PTH, or we can think of anti-resorptive agents like estrogen. So base phosphonates have been the long-term usage in terms of the overall therapy 
which cause disruption of the osteoclast. We can think of using the rank ligand inhibitor, which will again inhibit the osteoclast. We can use estrogen if there is hypogonadism. We can use the OPG agonist to really decrease resorption. And these are all the anti-resorptive agents, so to speak. On the other hand, we have got the anabolic agents like sclerostin inhibitors, PTH, and GH. We can also think of calcitonin, which is not very effective in the long term. It is just a short-term therapy in that regard. Now, if you compare the anti-resorptive from anabolic, in anti-resorptive, what you're doing is that you're just stopping bone resorption. But that would mean that the normal process of bone modeling is being affected and you may actually be accumulating a bad bone which may predispose to a poor quality of bone. While anabolic agents are producing new bone and they are improving the quality overall in that regard. So we would prefer this, but at the moment, bisphosphonates are the key treatment in terms of therapy. So what bisphosphonates do, they are pyrophosphate analogs. Once given, they go into the bone, they get deposited there. And once they are there, they interfere with this action and they have a direct effect on the osteoclast. They will destroy all the enzymes of these osteoclasts and subsequently they will also destroy the osteoclast. So their effect is long lasting in this regard because they block and kill the osteoclast perspective. Because the bone is being formed, we will increase the bone mass. Because bone resorption provides calcium and in this process, this calcium is not coming out of the bone. There will be a risk of hypocalcemia as we discussed in the first case in this regard. Now, bisphosphonates have been there for quite some time. The initial ones were less potent, but as the chemical modification was done, we have got these amino terminal bisphosphonates which are more active, like alendronate or pamidronate, and now we've got the third generation, the most potent being the zoledronate. So, as the structure becomes bigger, they become more complex, their overall potency also increases in this regard. Now, pamidronate and zoledronate are the two major agents that we talk about. So, pamidronate has been used for a long time. It's a second generation. This phosphonate has been there for a long time. And there are specific protocols which are used with regards to the dosage in this regard. And we can use it at different stages and different doses which are there. Now, what we need to remember is that in the younger age group, we don't talk about giving a high dose. We talk about more frequent dosing than a higher dose because there will be a risk of hypocalcemia which may happen in that regard. So best would be to admit these children and they will require maybe two to three days admission because it is multiple infusions which are given in the line over four hours acute phase reaction. So it was a bit of a problem in treating these small children. Now what happened with zolendronate is that now we have got a highly potent option which has got a direct effect on osteoblast as well it has a very long duration of action, do not need to give it on a multiple day basis. And therefore, most people are now shifting towards zoledronic acid. And if we talk about the dosage, start off with a very low dose to begin with. If you're talking about somebody in a young age, and as age progresses, you can increase the dose in that regard. So the error in the second case that we discussed was that they had given a higher dose of 0 0.25, 0 0.025 rather than the lower dose in this regard. Now, it's a simple injection, once a day, one dose, and they will improve, but there will, of course, be a huge phase reaction which may happen. Now, with the use of bisphosphonates, fracture risk goes down, pain will come down, bone density will increase, but there could be an intermittent mineralization. So there will be points which will have more mineral, there will be points which will have less mineral, and that may predispose to a bad bone that we're discussing and maybe some form of fracture that we have to be wary about. These effects are sustained for a long time and they will improve over time. So the major adverse effects of bisphosphonates are acute phase reaction, which is common. We have to give just paracetamol, no rule of steroids. Hypocalcemia, very common, 20 to 40%. So be wary about that. Ensure that there is calcium and vitamin D. Maintain vitamin D beyond 30 mg nanogram per ml. Very important because of that intermittent mineralization, you can see atypical fracture. This is the most strong point of femur, but you can have a fracture here with a bisphosphonate use. This also has an effect. Do not try to over suppress. The risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw is extremely low in children. 
This has been reported mainly in terms of women who were on a long-term therapy for some other cancer therapy. So it's not common in children, but if you have a dental procedure, you have to be a bit careful in this regards. Now, there are other effects like uveitis, and there are some other things which we have to avoid in terms of malignancy. So coming out of the most common indication in pediatric age group, the oxygenesis imperfecta, the drug we can use is either pamidronate, which typically is around 0.5 to 1 milligram per kg per day, roughly 10 to 15 milligram per kg in the whole year. Or you can use zoladronic. Our center or most centers are using zoladronic, which are more commonly used. Alendronate can be used in older individuals in this regards. It is an oral preparation. Now, the effect of it is improvement in bone pain, fracture rate. It has no effect on growth and healing in this situation. Now, the maximum effect which occurs is by three to four years. So maybe continuing it for a long time is not good. Do not try to overtreat because that will suppress bone resorption and you may have bad bone accumulating, causing all those fractures and also the risk of having osteonecrosis of the jaw. So in, when should you treat? Any infant with fracture, definitely you need to treat. At two to four years, if they have recurrent fracture or vertebral collapse, treat. If you have five to 18 years and you've got low bone mass with fractures. So as we have got milder forms of OI, we may not need to treat them now. We can wait till they fracture. And in adults, only if there is low bone mass with fractures would you require treatment in that perspective. Very importantly, we should be wary about not overcorrecting. So if the BMDZ score is continues to be low, you continue in the same dose. But if it has become better in the normal range, you reduce the dose to half. And if it has become more than zero, maybe reduce the dose hugely to actually maybe around one eighth of the actual dose. So you have to titrate. And this is a new concept which has come in that we don't want to overtreat in terms of bone suppression. So we had this four week old girl with OI, this we discussed. Now on follow up, the fracture rate has decreased and she had a reduced fracture. And now people say whether we continue therapy or not, because some people think that it may affect the fracture healing. Now, if you look out here, there is no effect of this phosphorate on fracture healing, and we can use it irrespective of if there is a fracture in that regard. So don't worry about it. Now, as follow up at 12 years, there is a functional improvement. Fracture rate has come down. BMD is minus 1.6. So what do we do? So of course, we have to titrate it. Now, since the BMD is between minus 2 to 0, we have to cut down the dose. So just don't go in terms of continuing the same dose. Reduce the dose because we don't want over suppression and adynamic bone to happen. What about glucocorticoid induced osteoporosis? Very common in terms of pediatric factors because of Cushing syndrome or in the perspective of treatment. Very important to do a proper vertebral fracture assessment using an X-ray or some DEXA machines also do that before starting long-term glucocorticoids at baseline in six months. Give calcium and vitamin D to everybody till the treatment continues and three months later. This phosphonates may be used if the BMD Z score is going below minus two with fractures and very importantly, even with inhaled cortisol, if you're giving it beyond 800 micrograms per day, you have to be very wary in that regards. Now, 15-year-old boy with juvenile chronic arthritis on long-term steroids, they have fragility fractures and a BMD is really low. So this case really requires treatment. He is pre-pubertal, so there are multiple issues going on in that regards. Once we correct for the puberty, you see BMD Z score comes down to minus 2.8. So always correct the BMD for the age, the bone age, and the pubertal status. And if we now go by the ACR recent recommendations two years back, what they say is that if somebody is on a high dose of low or required, if fracture happens, there is a role of this phosphonate. So now we are talking about proactive treatment and not waiting in that regard. Now, the other options which are there but not usually used in children include PTH, which basically is a potent compound which increases the phosphorus excretion, increases calcium absorption, causing high calcium and low phosphorus. It also has a direct effect on the osteoblast and an indirect effect on osteoclast. So in a way, PTH has an effect on bone. It also has an effect of suppressing sclerostin. So if PTH is given intermittently, the bone mass will go up. If it is given continuously, the bone mass will then come down. So PTH is something which is good and we have got the synthetic peptide 
periperitide or a synthetic analog of the PPH lipid peptide, the alloperiperitide, they are not yet approved for children because of a theoretical risk of osteosarcoma. In terms of that, if you want to think of, always work up for calcium, phosphorus, and enzyme phosphatase, and the dose is 20 milligrams per gram subcutaneously. Couple of other agents, denosumab, very commonly now used in adults, a subcutaneous injection, which is to be given maybe 6 to 12 monthly, it inhibits the right ligand, which will basically cause decreased bone resorption from the osteoblast class and therefore the bone density will increase because the entire bone resorption is taken off you will have a risk of hypocalcemia you have to be very wary about very importantly they do not get deposited in the bone so while bisphosphonate effects may last for years rank ligand inhibitors will go off very quickly and once you stop the osteoclast will really start working hard and therefore after discontinuation there will be bone loss so do not stop uh, uh, you know, so map, or you start bisphosphonate then, and there is a risk of rebound hypercalcemia. Dose is 60 to 120 milligrams, six monthly, mostly for adults in osteoporosis, and follow up for bisphosphonate is essential because of that rebound effect which may happen. So the sclerostin inhibitor is under experiment, and this could be something which will improve because this will be an anabolic agent to improve bone health and improve bone mass. So low bone mass is common and important to think of. If you have a fragility fracture, think of workup and therapy. Interpret BMD as per puberty, growth, and bone age. Bisphosphonates are the mainstay in terms of treatment for OI. A very careful assessment and management of conditions is required with different agents, particularly if somebody is on therapy which can decrease the bone density. And this is extra. Dr. Parvati, who is asking about uh, pre-treatment with steroids before bisphosphonate. So as we have covered, there is no role of giving steroids in pre-treatment because usually paracetamol is enough in that regard. The next question again from Dr. Parvati is the BMD cutoff of stopping bisphosphonates in OI. If pediatric available, not available, can we go clinically? So generally when we talk about the BMD cutoff uh, of those zero and how they are improving and the age is improving, Ideally, it should be a pediatric software, but this is going to happen maybe after 10 years. So if at that time you can maybe try to interpret the adult software, but I'll highly recommend that we should do uh, assessment in that regards so from a pediatric perspective. Dr. Rajesh is asking about at what age do we start doing DEXA in infants with OI? So generally speaking, when you talk about first two years, you're mainly looking at bone mineral content. So if you have somebody who has got definite fracture, who has got features of OI, who has got a family history, don't do a DEXA at that point of time. At least four to five years therapy is required. So I would say maybe four to five years is the right time to do a, a proper DEXA assessment. And probably we'll take this last question. Dr. Girish, in a 15-year-old patient with steroid-induced compression of the vertebra, can we use oral alendronate instead of pamidronate if patient is not willing for injections? What would be the end point? So I would say that generally oral agents are more for prophylaxis rather than therapy. So if you already had uh, compression of the vertebra, maybe zoledronic acid will be good. It's just once, maybe six months or once in a year subsequently. Alendronate, the compliance issue, the gastric side effects and all those issues are there. So, and they are probably not that effective in that perspective. So